Morning, everybody. My name is Leanne Wells. I'm the CEO of the Consumer Health Forum of Australia. Um, as many of you would know, we are the national voice for patients and health consumers here uh, uh, for Australia. Uh, we're a member-based organisation and um, uh, we've engaged in COVID in, in many ways, which I'll briefly talk about in a moment. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all joining uh, from today. I'm in Canberra, so that's the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. CHF acknowledged the ongoing contribution Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play and make to the health and wellbeing of our communities. And we recognise the importance of self-determination and community-centred services for good health outcomes for Australians, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Well, the topic we're here to talk about today is COVID, a once in a century issue um, occupying the public's mind like, like no other. For CHF's part, we've, we've uh, put out various position statements on issues related to the pandemic, ranging from a position statement on ethical considerations through to a position statement earlier this year on the rollout. Uh, we've, we've engaged with the Australian Health Ethics Committee of the NHMRC. We're part of the NHMRC, oh, actually it's not an NHMRC initiative, but the National COVID, uh, COVID Evidence Task Force, Living Evidence Task Force. Um, but importantly for our members, we've served as a conduit you know, for information to members and their consumer networks, hence this network, uh, hence this webinar today. So it's a rapidly moving space, as you would know. We had the roadmap for the vaccine announced earlier in January. The information campaign has been launched. There were funds announced yesterday for communication strategies, specifically for culturally and lingu linguistically diverse groups. Announcements yesterday about more Pfizer vaccine purchases. So every day uh, there's new information and new announcements um, on what is in a major undertaking. But equally, there's a lot of noise um, and to some extent some misinformation, which is a risk to uh, what we want or want to be um, a very successful public health campaign. Like the government, CHF want to ensure that the most up to date and factual information is available as widely as we can possibly get it. So to that end, we're really pleased to have here today, and I know you're both very, very busy people, so we really do value your time. Uh, Professor Michael Kidd, who would be well known to everyone, I'm sure, Deputy Chief Medical Officer in the Commonwealth, and Lisa Schofield, who is the head of the vaccine, National Vaccine Task Force. So welcome to you both. Just a bit of housekeeping before I hand over to you. We've um, received over 100 questions, probably up to, upwards to 200 now in advance. We've tried to group those into themes and we've provided those to Lisa and Michael in advance. So I'm pretty sure to the extent that they do have the answers um, that they'll cover off the key ones and the priority ones in what they have to say today. We will be taking questions as we go as well. We've disabled chat just because of the numbers we've got online. But we will also, uh, but Q&A uh, is open and you're welcome to put any questions you have in the Q&A box and we'll curate those and attempt to get answers either today or post webinar to you. Um, and then we'll obviously want to reinforce where people can go for um, credible and authoritative information at the end of the webinar. So that's enough from me by way of introduction. So over to you. Michael and Lisa for, for a consumer and community and consumer organisation update briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne, and thank you uh, to everybody uh, online for joining us today. It's wonderful to have uh, such a high level of interest in the national COVID-19 vaccine rollout. I wanted to start by saying a big thank you to you, Leanne, and to the Consumer Health Forum. Uh, we've been working incredibly closely over the last year on the COVID-19 response uh, from the Australian government. It's been incredibly important to have the consumer voice uh, at all levels of decision making and policy making and program rollout uh, as we together tackle this 
uh, pandemic and its impact on the health and well-being of the people of Australia. So thank you to the CHF, but also thank you to all the organisations which make up the Consumer Health Forum. Thank you for all the work that you've all been doing over the past year. Uh, thank you for sharing the messages uh, from the Commonwealth Government uh, and thank you for your feedback. And of course, this is going to continue as the pandemic continues, but also as we now embark on the largest mass immunisation program our nation has ever seen, this vaccination for COVID-19. So just wanted to give you just a brief update as to where we are uh, in the process. And uh, Lisa's going to tell you some specifics about um, uh, the, uh, the national rollout. Uh, and then we're very keen to uh, address as many of your questions as we can. Some of your questions, we won't be able to provide answers today. It's really important for us to know what questions people are asking and what are the sort of issues that your members into the communications which the Department of Health is developing. I just want to emphasise that the single source of truth uh, on all things COVID-19 remains the Australian Government Department of Health website, health.gov.au. I know you've all been accessing the website. Um, some of you I imagine on a daily basis, uh, but there is special uh, focus there on uh, the vaccines and on the communications campaign which has just started. So we've had a series of really important uh, announcements over the last couple of weeks. Monday last week we got the uh, announcement that the Therapeutic Goods Administration had provided provisional approval of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, the first COVID-19 vaccine to be approved uh, in Australia. Um, the uh, on, ongoing uh, discussions around uh, how that's going to uh, roll out and who's going to get it have been happening over the last two weeks on uh, Tuesday and announced the $1.9 billion uh, investment that the Australian government uh, is making uh, in addition to all its previous investments into tackling the pandemic. But the $1.9 billion going into the vaccine uh, rollout to uh, ensure that the vaccine is rolling out through hospitals around the country, through general practices, through pharmacies and through uh, other vaccination sites which uh, are being set up to ensure that we can offer the vaccine to every single person uh, in Australia. Uh, yesterday we had the announcement of the additional 10 million doses uh, of the Pfizer uh, vaccine, which will come into Australia over the coming year. Uh, with the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine that's still going through uh, its assessment from ATAGI, the Australian Technical Advisory Group and Immunisation, about a number of specifics related to the Pfizer vaccine. For example, uh, what will be the recommendations around uh, its use in uh, pregnant uh, women, uh, so on. Speeding, and uh, let's try and bring our camera back up. I think there might have been a problem with this. Okay. Okay. Can you just confirm you can still hear us? We're having a lot of trouble okay, hearing sorry. your bandwidth seems to be a problem, Lisa and Michael. We're having uh, very disjointed um, every second word sound. Um, I've, I see you've turned your uh, video off. Uh, that might help. Um, okay. Is that is is it clearer now, Leanne, without video? Can you hear it? It is better? clearer without video. I hope our audience can hear it a little bit better. Um, Perfect. You will be uh, Michael and Lisa will be sharing slides in a minute to everyone who's online, so you'll get to see uh, that shortly. And if if Lisa and Michael can keep their video off, hopefully the audio will be better from their end. Thanks everyone for your patience. Great. Thank you. 
Okay. So why don't, why don't we go to the slides and uh, and we'll we'll talk through those and see how we go. As Ian said, my sister, but I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon, and I echo Michael's thanks uh, um, this afternoon. If I can ask the team to bring up the slide deck. Perfect, thank you. And if you can go to the first, the next slide, please. So I just thought I'll take you through first, just the aims of the vaccination program, and I'll, I'll step through quite a few slides um, with bits of detail about how we're thinking about the rollout. And as Michael said, we're sort of keen to take as many questions as we can. So, um, so I'll scoot through these and, and see how we go. Um, the key aims of the vaccination program is of course to prevent death and severe disease and limit transmission of disease to the extent that it's possible. Secondly, to ensure equity of vaccine access and uptake in accordance with the priorities for vaccination in order to protect those most likely to experience serious disease, to maintain functioning of healthcare and other essential services, to preserve health, social and economic security, and to extend vaccination to the general population as quickly as possible. Thirdly, to promote public and health professional trust in the utility of COVID-19 vaccines and their implementation to the Australian community. And finally, to build towards herd immunity, noting that this, of course, is subject to uptake of the vaccines in Australia, the longevity and extent of immunity, the impact of the vaccines on transmission, um, and further data on the longevity and extent of immunity or transmission impact of the vaccines. Next slide, please. So you can see um, on this slide, well, these are the vaccine agreements that Australia has in place. Um, as Michael mentioned yesterday, the Australian government announced that we've purchased an additional 10 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Um, as you know, as the government has said that we're expecting delivery of those doses to begin in late February. To, we also, of course, have an agreement for the full population coverage in the number of doses. We're expecting our international um, doses to arrive in early March production to, you know, to really start and start delivering doses. We've got um, an agreement with Novavax who have reported, put out some initial data from their phase three trials a week or so ago. They're a little bit further behind in how that vaccine is progressing. So we're expecting to see deliveries of that vaccine, assuming obviously that it's, um, that it's successful um, to sort of start our through the year. And the Australian government has also joined the COVAX facility, um, both as a self-financing member, so that we can get enough doses for half of our population um, um, to have vaccines to them. Next to the prioritisation of the population, we're oh, getting feedback. Um, oh. <laughs> Okay, so this is the rollout strategy. You can see the, um, the obviously we've needed to sort of step the, um, the rollout out in phases. And obviously that's just due to the fact that we won't have enough um, vaccines on the first day to sort of get to everybody at the same time. So we've been working with the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, ATAGI. Um, and thank you, there are consumer representatives on, um, on ATAGI. So ATAGI has um, put a lot of time and effort and work into um, working with us to really design this program. Um, and the advice that they have given us that governments adopted, of course, is um, that we really need to prioritise the quarantine and border workers, the frontline healthcare workers, and then aged care and disability care, both staff and residents. So any of those first doses that we have will be, be prioritising access to those populations. And you can see there over time that as essentially as more doses become available, we'll then open the program up to, um, to more and more people in that kind of priority order. Um, and the prioritisation, of course, is just based on, um, you know, vulnerability um, and risk of transmission for, um, for COVID. Next slide, please. Um, I've just got a couple of slides um, here. This one sort of steps through the TGA um, process. So Michael indicated, of course, that Pfizer's being given its 
provisional um, registration in Australia. I guess I just want to step through that it's quite a complex, and I'm sure all people will know this better than me, but it's quite a complex sort of emergency use in Australia, the same as um, some of the other jurisdictions have. Um, and so the TGA is applying um, its usual process, um, just doing a, a number of things in parallel. So it really steps through with that pre-application stage, um, followed by a much more detailed application. Of course, there's rolling submission of data um, that goes into the TGA. The TGA does an evaluation step, um, which looks like a small box there in the middle, but I think is probably the one that um, takes obviously the most time and effort for the TGA. Um, also working with their advisory committee on vaccines. Um, there's then the decision point and that assuming that that's the decision that results in registration and there is of course an ongoing monitoring step um, post registration as well there is a lot of detail on these slides um, but just wanted to flag those key steps so we just check with you through okay what was your question michael Oh, is the audio better? It's, I think we are still getting quite a few comments saying that it's not good. Um, Can we turn this one off and we'll try this one? We'll just, we'll just try and switch. The okay, is that better? Can you, can you say a just I comment? Is that better? Can you hear us better now? I think it's worth persisting with for now. Okay. Yes, thanks, Michael. Let's see how we go with this one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here you can just see um, the steps in terms of um, how the vaccine actually kind of gets rolled out. Um, so starting on the left there, you can see the sort of TGA approval point that that sort of kicks off the program. Obviously, then we look at the manufacturing steps, um, both internationally and here in Australia. One of the reasons that the um, that the vaccines have been able to be made available um, much more quickly um, for COVID is that both the manufacturers and many governments around the world have actually invested in manufacturing capacity well before any vaccines were, um, were even close to, to being registered so that that capacity was there um, and ready should those um, registrations be successful. Once the doses then arrive in either in Australia or they come off the Australian production line at CSL, they'll then go through a, a TGA batch testing process to, um, to make sure that they're, um, that they're all safe. And then the doses are then transported um, to sites all over the countryside. Um, there's, we're looking at a number of vaccination locations and I'll take you through those in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, but then of course the doses will be administered. You'll need to have two doses for each of the vaccines that Australia has agreement for and for um, most, almost all of the COVID vaccines that are in development. And then of course, as I mentioned before, there is that ongoing safety monitoring process. Along the bottom of that slide, you can see this sort of, you know, vaccine monitoring process. Um, the government's setting up a system so that we can sort of see where the doses are, we can know where they're being delivered, we can know where we've got stock and, and where we need to move some more. And of course, monitoring the cold chain across the, um, across the full pathway. And really, um, really, really importantly, um, down on the right hand corner there, you can see that the record of vaccination will be in the Australian Immunisation Register. And um, that is a, um, it's a really significant um, piece of infrastructure that we have in Australia. We've had the air for, um, for quite some years now and, and being able to have that as single source of truth for everybody so that, um, you know, their vaccine can be um, registered and known, um, I think is really important. So next slide, please. I'm almost at the end so we can get to questions. Um, I just wanted just to touch on um, the types of places that we'll be using for vaccination and you've probably heard about all of these. So obviously we'll be using um, uh, big sort of clinics for, um, for Pfizer doses, big clinics for like mass vaccination clinics for, um, for the AstraZeneca doses. They'll be run by state governments um, in, you know, lots of places all over the countryside. 
We're also um, having general practices participate and we've had a huge, um, a huge level of interest from, um, from GPs wanting to participate, which is fantastic. We'll have also had, um, we're having engagement and involvement from the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services and our GP respiratory clinics. So again, right across Australia and community pharmacies as well. They're in the process of um, expressing interest. And so they'll be coming into the program a little bit later once we sort of move into the, um, the 2A phase or, or the sort of general population piece. And so just my last slide um, is just a reminder and, um, and Leanne mentioned this at the beginning and as did Michael, we've got the national campaign um, kicked off last weekend, I think. Um, and, and, you know, that single source of truth is health.gov.au and, and we'll be pushing out um, as much information as we can to try and answer everybody's questions um, about the vaccines and the vaccination program. So I will stop there. It looks like from the little Q&A boxes that our sound is a little bit better. So hopefully that's better for everyone and I'll stop and happy to take questions. Thanks very much, um, Lisa and Michael. Uh, we've got lots of questions, as you can imagine. So we won't get to them all, but they have clustered into some broad themes. Um, just um, perhaps the first question, and it was only because it was a current issue and I think it talks to access and timely access to the vaccine. There was some media commentary yesterday about whether or not nurses um, would be able to independently um, administer the vaccine. You talked about GPs, Lisa, just wondering what you can advise us about that. They're obviously a trusted health professional. Yeah, so I guess I would just start, Leanne, by saying that um, immunisation workforces are authorised under state legislation. So um, we're working really closely with all of the jurisdictions. We're doing sort of joint um, implementation plans for each of the jurisdictions. Um, I'm hoping that they'll be sort of settled over the next day or so. Um, and so it really is the decision about who it is that's allowed to immunise in any of those particular settings um, is a decision for the states in accordance with the, you know, their usual authorisation of, um, of the immunisation workforce. Thank you. Um, question from Susanna. Did you want to comment on that, Michael, or we keep pressing on? No, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, question from Susanna, what, what are, what's the proposed timing between the first and second dose? I mean, we've obviously seen some coverage from the UK there. Will it vary according to which vaccine you're given first? UK evidence suggesting longer gap may be better for some vaccines and not others. And then the second part to that question, will vaccines potentially be mixed first dose from one, second dose from another? A really important message is that people must get the same vaccine for the two doses. So there'll be no mixing. If you have the Pfizer dose uh, as your first dose, you must get the Pfizer dose as your second dose. If you have the AstraZeneca vaccine, if that's approved as your first dose, you must get the AstraZeneca as your second dose. At the moment, we have the advice from the TGA about the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the two doses are given uh, at least 21 days apart. And, uh, and what we expect will happen is that when people book in uh, to get their vaccine, get their first vaccine, they'll also book in at the same time for uh, the timing of their second dose as well. Right. And, uh, and so that way people will know when they're getting uh, the two doses. It's also, there's an important uh, factor here as well, Leanne, around the influenza vaccines because the influenza vaccines will be rolling out in uh, April and May uh, to cover people for this winter. And it's important that there is a 14 day gap between receiving a COVID-19 vaccine and an influenza vaccine. So people are gonna to need to work with their healthcare providers about coordinating uh, the timing of both the two doses of their COVID-19 vaccine, but also their flu vaccine for this year as well. Thanks for that clarity, Michael. That's, that's very clear for consumers. Um, just on a related issue, I guess, on what basis will eligibility decisions be made? Will GPs be allowed to decide? Will people be able to self-identify as eligible at certain phases, at, 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 at certain points, you know, the phases that you've outlined there? So really, people really, be notified in some way that they're part of phase 1A, 1B. Yes, so people, people under 1A will probably be notified uh, by their employers. This yeah. includes 
uh, people working in the quarantine uh, facilities, people working on uh, our borders. Um, so uh, maybe coming in contact with people arriving into Australia who have COVID-19. Obviously our frontline healthcare workforce, uh, the people who are working in um, wards which are looking after people with COVID-19, uh, they'll be advised by their employers and also the people working in our residential aged care facilities and our disability care facilities uh, will be advised and of course the residents of those facilities are in the top priority category. After that um, some people uh, it'll be based on your age so you'll need to uh, show uh, uh, evidence of your age um, as to which cohort that you're in. Um, and then there's people who have underlying medical conditions, including uh, people with uh, specific disability, which may put them at increased risk uh, of serious illness if they were to contract COVID-19. And, uh, and for those people, they'll either be attending uh, their general practice where their record already is, or they may need uh, to provide some evidence um, their specialist letters, whatever it may be, uh, that, uh, that they have that medical condition. I think it's really important that we make sure as a nation that the people who are most at risk of serious disease and at risk of death from COVID-19 are the people who get the vaccine first. And I don't think any of us will begrudge somebody who is at greater risk than we are uh, that they should get the vaccine before we do. And so that's why uh, we'll be working through these phases uh, and, um, and eventually uh, the entire population uh, will be protected. Everybody who is in Australia who wishes to get the COVID-19 vaccine will be able to get the vaccine uh, this year. Thank you, Michael. There's a few questions in the Q&A about other vaccines, Sputnik, Johnson & Johnson, for example, and whether these are likely to be approved and available in Australia. Um, so you might want to comment on that. And also the manufacturer. Um, it's only the AstraZeneca one that's being manufactured here. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so Leanne, there are, there's still about 200 odd um, vaccines that are being developed around the world, all at various states, um, sort of making their way through the system. Um, where the, the ones that we have um, agreements for have been um, sort of registered and are at various points of, you know, in discussions with the TGA um, for approval or consideration in Australia. Um, Johnson & Johnson or, or Janssen um, has got a provisional determination with the TGA and we don't, um, we don't have, the Australian government doesn't have an APA with J&J. &J. Um, we're continuing, so the government, um, my team, the task force is continuing to talk to all of the vaccine manufacturers pretty much to sort of keep up to date with what it is that they're all doing and how they're all tracking. Um, and the government has established We've got an expert group, the Science and Industry Technical Advisory Group that's chaired by um, Dr. Brendan Murphy, our secretary. Um, and that group sort of gives government advice on, you know, on other vaccines and, um, and other agreements that we may wish to um, enter into. But there will be, and, and you know, it's a, it's a good thing that there are other vaccines that are, you know, that are still being developed. I think, you know, as lots of people have said over the course of the pandemic, you know, the, the pandemic won't end. And, until sort of everybody's vaccinated. It's not gonna work if it's country by country, um, given how quickly this one spreads. Thanks very much again for that clarity of answer. Um, just back to aged care and aged care, aged care workers and workforce. And obviously the big trend in aged care these days is to, is place-based aged care and to be keeping people um, at home as long as we can, with home care packages, et cetera. So, just for clarity, the, the, the workforce there, the home care workers, cleaners and personal carers, uh, personal nurses, those sorts of aged care workforce who actually come to visit people in their homes will be part of the early vaccination plan? That's, that's right, Leanne. So phase 1B includes all people who are aged 70 and over, which of course will include many recipients of our home-based uh, aged care uh, and uh, healthcare workers, all healthcare workers around the country, which includes the people who are providing uh, care and support uh, to people in their own homes. Uh, once again, this is uh, a group 
uh, where it's important to uh, vaccinate the, the people coming into the homes of elderly people uh, because we don't want them bringing COVID-19 into the homes of, of elderly people. And, uh, and although we know that the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine is very effective at protecting people uh, against uh, serious uh, illness, uh, what we don't know is whether someone who's been vaccinated um, could still be at risk of transmitting COVID-19 uh, to other, other people. We're still to find the, out the research on this, which obviously is being carried out as these new vaccines are being introduced uh, all around the world. And that's why it's really important that everybody uh, at risk gets vaccinated. So we are all protected and not just relying on other people to get vaccinated for us. Mm, indeed. Um, Lisa and Michael, there's lots of questions in the chat about the exact timing of each phase. When will people in phases 1A and 1B expect to receive the vaccine? So I think there's a sense that people are looking for a more specific timeline. Yes, a more specific timeline would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess I'd say that, you know, we're hoping um, at this stage, based on what we know about sort of vaccines being available in Australia, um, sort of through that that sort of chart that, or the process that I talked through earlier, um, we're expecting the program to start in sort of late February. Um, and that will be with phase 1A, of course. So those first doses that come into the country, um, you know, we are only sort of expecting sort of 80,000 doses a week in those first few weeks of operation. So it's going to start... Um, it'll start small and we'll start getting to those phase 1A people straight away. Um, when we go into March, we'll start to see, obviously pending um, approval from the TGA, but we'll start to see um, the AstraZeneca doses come online in addition to the Pfizer doses. Um, so there's some that will start in early March and then um, we're expecting our local production to ramp up in late March. So I think... I don't, I don't really have any definite dates, but we would imagine that it'll be a couple of months from the beginning of phase 1A for us to have had enough doses out to get um, to ensure that all of those people have at least had access to the vaccine um, before we then will open it up to 1B. So essentially the key driver is going to be the volume of doses that we have that we can sort of push through all over the country um, that will then enable the next, the next group, the next cohort to then have access. And the national campaign that we're running will make sure that people know when that happens. So there'll be, you know, the ads that people will have already started to see on, on television and, and on radio. Um, so all of that will continue um, and they'll be really targeted towards the, the phases of the campaign um, so that, you know, people know which phase we're up to and, and when they can sort of jump on and make a booking and, and head in to get their vaccine. Thanks, Lisa. If I can go back to sort of vaccine safety issues, a couple of questions here. Um, while the government and, and organisations like ours absolutely want to get, you know, uh, the call out and the clear message out there, as you say, both of you, that, you know, until we're all vaccinated, we, we won't be all protected. That's that's the, the take out message. But, but but what risks should consumers be aware of, if any, um, when considering whether or not to have the vaccine, because they're not going to be, you know, there is a degree of consumer choice here, um, even though, um, you know, notwithstanding, you know, what you both said about the importance for us all to get vaccinated. Thanks, Leanne. So we're, we're fortunate in Australia because these vaccines have been rolling out in other countries uh, around the world under emergency provisions. So there's already been a lot of experience about um, uh, the safety uh, of the vaccines and uh, whether there should be concerns for individuals. Uh, a lot, lot of uh, evidence coming through about side effects. The side effects uh, in the vast majority of people are very mild. It's the sort of side effect you may get from the influenza vaccine. Your arm may be a little bit uh, sore uh, at the injection uh, site. Some people may feel a little uh, feverish or uh, tired after they've had the uh, vaccine, but uh, severe side effects seem to be incredibly rare. There have been uh, the reports of a few people having allergic reactions to the vaccine, uh, and these have been in people who have been known to be allergic uh, to vaccines uh, in the past. But that's why when people get their vaccine, they'll be required 
to be observed for at least 15 minutes to make sure they don't get one of these allergic reactions after the vaccine has been uh, administered. And it's also why we'll be rolling out the vaccine in centres which are staffed by nurses and doctors, so that if someone did have one of these very rare reactions, uh, that could be uh, managed very, very quickly. Uh, we are uh, waiting for advice from ATAGI, the Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, about um, the safety of the Pfizer vaccine in women who are pregnant, uh, women who are planning to become pregnant, uh, or women who are breastfeeding and that advice will come, come through. And uh, it is early days in, uh, in these vaccines. Um, so we're, we're waiting for that advice. Uh, we're also awaiting advice on the use in uh, very frail elderly people who are at the end of their lives. You will have seen some news reports um, from Europe about, um, uh, about use of the vaccines. We haven't seen any uh, indication that the vaccine uh, actually caused um, uh, death in uh, these very frail elderly people. It looks like this was just nature uh, and its course, but we'll get some advice about that um, as well. Okay, so I've got a couple of, and again, you know, obviously quality and safety is what's going to be so important in the public mind just just picking up on that thread a little bit more Michael some people are concerned that the vaccine is is still in trial phase in inverted commas how can we reassure people uh, that uh, any vaccine approved in Australia is safe um, you know the lay public generally speaking TGA and our regulatory strength there um, is probably not top of mind for people Yes, so we can be assured because of the reputation that the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration has, we take very seriously the uh, safety of any new vaccine or medication which is uh, permitted to be authorised for use in Australia. And before uh, any approvals are given, uh, the companies which are producing the vaccine are required to provide very detailed evidence of the clinical trials which have been carried out. And so for the Pfizer vaccine, these clinical trials have now been carried out for many months involving many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people in countries all around the world. So we get a very good uh, understanding of the safety profile uh, of the vaccines. And then very importantly, uh, once uh, something is approved for use in Australia, uh, the TGA follows up very closely uh, the reports of any side effects, no matter how mild, uh, which may occur in the administration of vaccine at very high levels, but also the continuing evidence coming from the rollouts which are occurring in countries all around the world. So people are taking this very, very seriously, the safety and efficacy uh, of these vaccines vaccines as they roll out. We won't get additional vaccines approved for use in Australia until they have met the same quality and safety and efficacy standards uh, set by the Therapeutic Goods Administration uh, here in Australia. We haven't uh, authorised use of vaccines as emergency provisions in Australia because we haven't had the same terrible impact uh, of the pandemic that we're seeing currently in countries with those emergency provisions like the United Kingdom and the USA and elsewhere. There's no doubt we're in a very, very um, privileged position as a country. I think we'd all agree with that one. Um, just will the vaccine stop transmission? There's been a lot of discussion about this or just people experiencing the disease. And, and what does that mean for achieving um, herd immunity? Yes, so the goal at the moment is not to achieve herd immunity. The goal at the moment is to protect people from serious disease and from death. If in the long term that leads to herd immunity, that's, uh, that'll be a good thing. But there are a number of things we don't yet know about these vaccines. Uh, as you say, Leanne, we don't know if people who are immunised can still be infected and have asymptomatic infection and transmit COVID-19 to somebody else. We don't know how long the protection uh, lasts from the vaccine or whether like the influenza vaccine will need a booster 
against COVID-19 uh, on an annual basis or, or some other uh, time frame. Um, so there's, there's still a number of things about the vaccines that we don't know. There, there are concerns about some of these new variants of COVID-19 which are appearing uh, around the world. It appears that the vaccines which are going through the approval processes in Australia are still very effective against um, the new variants which have appeared uh, to date. But um, it's another reason why we need to get global vaccination happening uh, quickly so that we don't uh, have COVID-19 still circulating amongst very large numbers of people, which increases the risk of new variants uh, appearing. Um, so there, there are a number of things. We don't know how long immunity lasts if people have been infected with COVID-19, with the nearly 30,000 people in Australia who've had COVID-19. We don't know how long their immunity lasts either. It's all very new. And there are a lot of questions which still need to be answered. Uh, but we will be providing answers as we have been throughout the last year. Um, every time new pieces of evidence become available, we'll be, be providing that uh, those details uh, to the people of Australia. Mm. And and I think that, just, oh, sorry, Lisa, yeah. Sorry, Lynn, I was just gonna add, I mean, just to Michael's last point around, you know, it's still very new and there's many things to learn. I guess one of the things that has been really clear throughout this whole pandemic has been, the, you know, the global coordinated um, collaborative research effort that's happening everywhere to, um, to learn more about the disease every day, to learn more about the vaccines every day. Um, and so, as you mentioned, um, I, I think, Leanne, at, your, at the beginning, you know, there's, there's something every, every day and there's actually many things every day that, that sort of happen in this. And, and I think, as Michael said, it's really important for us as government to whenever there is new information to make sure that we can get that out to everybody as soon as we can. Um, and I will just do another plug for health.gov.au. Um, you know, that whenever there is anything new that we can provide, um, we will put that up there so that people can get um, that information as quickly as they can. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I've got uh, uh, one more vaccine safety question, then I'll come to some questions we're getting around rollout and recording of vaccines and things like that. But, um, and, and I think you've partly answered this, Michael. Some consumers have expressed concerns that vaccine manufacturers are being absolved of liability and that the vaccine is being rushed out before it's fully tested, vaccines plural. Um, what, what, what do you say to those people? Yes, well, I think I've covered some of that, of course, yeah. with the, the process which we're going through in Australia. And uh, we are not rushing uh, things. We are not cutting any corners. Every vaccine which is being looked at in Australia is going through exactly the same process, uh, which happens for vaccines uh, against other conditions or medication used for, uh, for other conditions. Uh, what is happening is that it's happening uh, quite quickly. So the normal process is happening, but because of the urgency of the pandemic, uh, we have had people working day and night on the approvals process throughout the, the Christmas break. Lisa uh, herself has not had any uh, break uh, over, the, over the holiday period, um, and, uh, and neither have many members of her her team. And uh, so we are doing things as quickly as we can, but no corners are being cut. Mm. Every step in the process is being followed rigorously and thoroughly so that the Australian public can be confident in the safety of the vaccines being approved uh, here in Australia. Thanks, Michael. Um, in your presentation, Lisa, you talked about obviously the immunisation register being utilised um, and the fact that people had a vaccine uh, that that will be recorded there. So so I think that answers the question here I've got about how will evidence of having the vaccine be recorded. But I would have thought that if ever there was a role for My Health Record, um, this is it. So what what can you tell us about the role My Health Record will play in all of this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, the, the asset that is, you know, the Australian Immunisation Register um, is probably one that sort of, I don't think probably occurred to a lot of people of, until we're sort of partway through this pandemic. And we start to think about, you know, all of the, the things that, you know, that vaccination records will be relevant for in the future and having air there 
um, to be able to do that in Australia is really important. And um, just as a, a quick aside, was really pleased to see the legislation go through Parliament um, yesterday that will be mandating um, recording of all immunisations into air. So starting with COVID, of course, um, but air will now be, you know, it will be a requirement for all of the healthcare providers to register everybody's immunisations um, in air. So for flu um, and for all of the other programs. So I think that's a, a huge step forward for, um, for Australia more broadly. In terms of people accessing that information, so right now you can do that. You can grab your immunisation statement um, and you can do it through my health record. You could do it through my of, there's a few different ways that you can grab that out now. Um, we're working to make that even easier. I'm obviously conscious of how many people will probably for the first time want to have a look at their immunisation statement. Um, yeah, so we're working um, obviously with our colleagues in Services Australia um, and in ADHA around um, how we can make all of that a bit easier. I'm also engaging with the market. We know that there will be lots of commercial providers that will want to have apps that will have it on their phones and, and those sorts of things. So um, they're all sort of things that are, um, are being you know, pondered and, and thought about now. Mm -hmm. um, just as a little aside, I will say that, you know, when you turn up to get your vaccine, you will get a little card that just tells you that you've sort of had your first dose and it'll have the date, um, you know, for your appointment for your second dose so that people can still, we know that people still really like the idea of, you know, coming out of the clinic with, um, with something in their hand. So we'll be doing that as well. Thanks, Lisa. I mean, clearly, you know, consumers are not all the same, are we? Um, very, very diverse groups. So lots of people in the chat and in the questions we got in advance with specific conditions like people with immun immunosuppressed conditions, people with severe allergies, uh, intellectual disability, the whole spectrum, you know, seeking guidance on whether the vaccine is suitable for them. So, and I mentioned, you know, we, we've been involved and I think it's a fantastic initiative here at the National COVID Living Evidence Task Force and that initiative. Um, it, is, it literally is living evidence, isn't it? Because there's new information about treatment, management, et cetera, coming forward yep. every day and every week, it seems. So how are clinical guidelines being developed and how can clinicians and GPs get access to that information in the best way? Mm. So I'll, I'll sort of, um, you know, back your comments on the clinical evidence, like the living, the living guidelines piece. It's been, um, again, that's been one of those things that Australia, um, we, we weren't sort of doing that and we've tried it, um, funded it as some sort of innovation research activity at the beginning of the pandemic, made a huge difference about being able to get information out to clinicians, by clinicians on, um, on the best ways to kind of manage COVID when it was turning up in a, um, in a clinical environment. Um, I've lost the question. Well, that's okay. Uh, where, where are you going to get your advice about oh, what to do? Sorry, yeah. Michael. Um, so we have Atagi, who I've mentioned um, before, and uh, he's actually has drafted and put together some um, the clinical guidelines, um, clinical guidance around um, the Pfizer vaccine that's been authorised. Um, that's being consulted on at the moment. So it's out with a number of other expert groups, including a number of the colleges. So, you know, engagement um, on allergies, engagement, you know, um, with with lots of the different sort of specialists, I guess, across Australia. Um, and we're hoping that that will be sort of settled quite soon and, and, and published so that, that um, all of the clinicians can see that. So ATAGI really will be playing the usual role um, that they do with their COVID vaccines, the same as they do with others, um, and sort of working in close partnership and a lot of engagement with the relevant um, colleges and specialists to make sure that all of those, um, as you say, Leanne, everyone's different, you know, to sort of make sure that we can cover as many of those issues as we can yeah so i guess leanne it, it's important that that people have uh all sorts of different ways to get access to to information so there's there's the australian government um website but many people will want to talk to their own mm -hmm. doctor uh or their other trusted healthcare provider about um should i get the vaccine is it going to be safe uh for me with uh with the conditions uh, that I have. And uh, they're the sort of discussions, of course, which we have uh, around anything that that, uh, that concerns us and that will continue. But we'll be getting information out to you treating doctors and other healthcare mm -hmm. providers um, so they can assist you in making an informed decision. That That's good to know. And um, we, we would expect that. I mean, obviously, through our own research, we know that, you know, trusted providers like, like pharmacists and GPs and nurses are uh, who people will listen to. Um, just a question now about rural and remote access. You know, we, I don't think we forget in this country that, 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 you know, we don't, you know, we don't all live in, in, um, 
in centres on the eastern seaboard, but we do have 7 million or so, don't we, people living in rural and remote Australia and some people living very remotely and rurally. Um, we know that the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at incredibly uh, low, low temperatures. So how will people in rural and regional areas get access to the vaccine? Will they be required to travel to a regional hub? Um, so what that look like? Yeah, so I guess I'd say from the outset um, that no, we definitely don't forget about rural and regional um, at all. And I always say I grew up in way country in New South Wales, very far away from um, anything like a, a regional town. Um, so if, uh, I guess personally, I'm really conscious of it, but obviously government's really conscious of it too. Um, one of, the, one of the slides that I went through sort of talked about the breadth of the sorts of providers and locations that we're looking to use and establish for purposes of the program. And, and one of the reasons that we're doing that, so we'll have, um, we will of course have sort of mass vaccination clinics, the same as there are testing clinics around the place, there'll be vaccination clinics um, and they'll predominantly be run by state governments. They'll stand those up to, um, to run those facilities. I've spoken to all of the jurisdictions. Um, they're all thinking about how they stand up those facilities in different parts of the country. So, you know, using town halls or showgrounds or all those types of locations that, um, you know, that are scattered um, everywhere. And of course, engagement from our GP community and our pharmacy community will be really important for that as well, because of course there are GPs and pharmacies almost everywhere. Um, so that sort of gives us a really good sort of spread, I think, in terms of how it is that people can access vaccines, kind of you know, starting to think about it in the same way as, you know, how it is that you would ordinarily access your flu vaccine should be the same kind of way that you would be able to access a COVID vaccine. Um, we are conscious, of course, that Pfizer, that the Pfizer vaccines, you know, are harder to manage, um, but they won't be restricted to metropolitan areas. We will have Pfizer clinics um, in a number of regional sort of centres around Australia. Um, and I guess two other things, um, is that we will be doing um, the Commonwealth for the most part, we'll be looking after sort of aged care facilities. And so we'll be doing that as an in-reach service. Um, and so that will be done, you know, with different vaccines, depending on, you know, availability and sort of what we have, but that will definitely be done with some of the, like with Pfizer vaccines, um, in addition to others as they start to come online. Um, and so again, there won't be a, a separation, I guess, really between um, metro and anywhere else. It will just be, you know, we need to map out ways of making our way across the countryside to get to everyone. Um, and just the last thing is that we've had a lot of conversations with um, particularly the Northern Territory, WA, um, Queensland and South Australian governments around, you know, the really sort of remote parts, remote communities um, in Australia. And we've done a lot of planning around how it is that we can get vaccines to those communities so that those communities don't have to come, you know, whether it's to Alice or to, um, you know, to Gove or, or to those places. So um, we're certainly planning, you know, we're trying to make sure that we've got a program that makes it as easy as possible for people to access a vaccine. Mm. Thank you. And when people do get to a general practice or pharmacy or a hospital or, a, or a, 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 some other form of vaccination clinic, um, will, will they have a choice which vaccine they see, receive and if not, who decides? I mean, obviously in other, dimension, other domains of healthcare, healthcare you know, the, the, the messaging these days, it's all, all, all it's all about consumer agency and informed choice and people having some sense of control in a shared decision-making paradigm around the care they receive. But just, just your thoughts on that question and issue. Well, at the moment, of course, there's only one vaccine which has been approved yeah. uh, in Australia. So that's the Pfizer vaccine. So that's, that's the, uh, there's no choice really there. Um, when the other vaccines um, start to get approved, uh, in Australia, it, initially it will depend on uh, the distribution uh, of the vaccine. So what's been distributed to the site where you're going to get, uh, to get your vaccine and, uh, and what's available. But all the vaccines which will be approved in Australia, we will only be approving vaccines which are safe and effective. Uh, the difference may be if, if there are uh, different uh, if there are restrictions with a particular vaccine, so it may not be recommended for use in different people in the population. At the moment, um, we don't have a vaccine uh, which is approved for use in children. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine is approved for use in people 16 and, and older, but there is no vaccine for children. So uh, we're going to need to watch this space uh, over the coming uh, months as new vaccines uh, emerge and become available. 
Thank you. And look, there's a comment here I'd, I'd share with you, Michael, you might be able to see it in the in the chat box. But, um, you know, I think most people really, really appreciate and understand the enormity of the task that the government has to do here. You know, you both talked about this is the biggest mass immunisation we've ever had to do in, in our history. And um, there's just a comment here, and I might close with this. Um, uh, thank you, Michael and, and Lisa, for telling people how it really is that, that, that you don't know everything, that the government doesn't know everything, um, and a bit of a plea <laughs> to the extent you can uh, to ask the media to do the same. Um, it is a complex messaging task. Um, so, you know, I think the more channels and the more trusted sources of information, um, particularly to counter some of them, um, the simplification uh, that's happening in the media um, is really, really welcome and the, the campaign will go some way to that extent. And I know you, you are working with um, organisations, with Cal Communities and others. Um, we've just got a couple more minutes. I might just flick through here. There's so many questions um, and we will try. Uh, we'll come back to you, Lisa, if you don't mind, offline and perhaps work out how we can best work with you um, to answer some of those, notwithstanding there is the website um, that you have referred to. Um, maybe just a final question then about equity of rollout. Um, how will you ensure equity in the timing and scope of the vaccine rollout, given it's a national program being delivered in different states and territories? Yeah, it's something that, um, it's a really good question and it's something that, you know, we turn our minds to a lot when we're sort of working through the details of the planning. And I guess it's the way that we're addressing that is to sort of make sure that we're having as many lenses put over the program as we can, you know, to really kind of, you know, attack the problem from a, a bunch of different sorts of, um, sorts of angles. So, you know, having, um, having, you know, clinics, like hubs to sort of look after the Pfizer vaccine and being kind of clear about where they are and that they'll probably, you know, be established and, um, you know, and standalones there for, um, for the length of the year to really sort of service that because of the infrastructure that's required to those. But having that really balanced out by, as I said before, this sort of plethora of other providers that really can be all over the place. Um, Certainly we're doing sort of planning at a jurisdictional level, which, you know, but because it's a national program allows us to sort of make sure that all the jurisdictions are, are sort of thinking about all of the same issues as each other to get some level of um, national consistency and equity there. But also thinking when we've been thinking about aged care, really, um, you know, we're working with the, um, the PHNs really closely on that. So we're kind of looking at aged care from a PHN area perspective rather than a state um, area. So I guess for us, it's just about looking at a whole bunch of different ways that we can slice and dice Australia um, and make sure that we, you know, kind of have something everywhere so that, as I said, it's as easy as possible for people to, you know, to get access to a vaccine. Um, I don't for a second think that this is going to be an easy task to do. And, you know, there'll be days that, something will go wrong in the program. But I guess I'd say that, you know, uh, there's a full commitment. I've never seen the sort of collaboration and cooperation across the federal government and state governments and local governments and consumer organisations and peaks and everybody um, who are all really just wanting to, you know, try their hardest to, to get this done. So, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll, um, that we'll deliver on that equity piece and that, as I said, access will be um, as easy as possible. Thank you, and I'm sure we've got lots of organisations behind you, which say ranging from professional organisations to organisations like ours. Final question, um, squeeze in a minute. Um, if time, well, I've got the time to ask this, but what, what will COVID safe, just briefly, look like once a substantial number of people have been vaccinated? COVID safe, COVID normal? It's a really important question, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't, it's a big one to end with. Yeah, and... <laughs> yeah. and some of those questions that we don't yet know the answers to are going to determine what COVID safe looks like. But I think the most important issue is that while we roll out the vaccine, people must continue to behave in a COVID safe way as we've all learned to do over the last year. Very important that we don't get serious outbreaks occurring while the population is only partly 
immunised against COVID-19 because it will still put people at significant risk. So please, everyone, get out to your, your organisations the importance of everyone remaining COVID safe, adhering to um, all those practices which we're doing to protect ourselves, our loved ones and the wider community. And I just want to finish just with a, a huge thank you Leanne, both to you and the CHF, but also to everybody uh, online. Thanks for the great questions. I hope CHF can capture all the questions which have been put in the chat box and send them through to us because there's a lot there that's going to inform our ongoing communications. So I just want to say a huge thank you for such an, uh, an interactive uh, webinar session today. Thank you. Well, thank you both, Michael and Lisa. Um, can I confirm that you're happy for us to share the slides with participants and with, with um, our wider networks? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Great. And that's our job, Michael. You know, we will certainly um, curate and collate um, all the questions we've got, both pre-webinar and the uh, almost 150 plus questions that have come through on the Q&A box on this chat alone um and send those through to you but we'll cluster them up into into some themes and um if that can assist in any way your communication strategy that that's fantastic so thanks once again to you both uh thanks to our participants today and and thanks to everyone for uh persisting with the uh tech issues or the audio issues at the outset but i think we we got better audio as we went along so on that note thanks again have a lovely day Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye.